Well, we might start. I'll, uh, first, I'm just going to share my screen and just play a brief uh, intro video, and then we'll get into our discussion. Let's just uh, try that again. There we are. So if you want to make a real impact in the world and you want to develop skills that make you very employable, then you might want to think about studying environment issues. Environment issues are core to a lot of the important challenges around the world. Challenges in how, in how we feed people, how we have sustainable cities, uh, how we manage bushfire, how we manage climate change and, and, and so on. And a really, uh, it's a great opportunity to study environment issues at the ANU because the ANU has the Fenner School of Environment and Society. And the Fenner School, we recognise that environment issues have got that uh, dimension to do with the plants and the animals and the trees and the soil and so on, but they always also have a human dimension, that's the society part. And we, we bring both of those elements to any, anything we study. We have leading researchers in the school that are making a big difference in the world themselves, but also play a role in teaching the courses that we teach. So if you're really passionate about environment, we've got a degree just for you called the Bachelors in Environment and Sustainability. And that's a course that focuses in the Fenner School that has opportunities in other schools. But actually, you might be more interested in doing a Bachelor of Science or Arts, or you might want to study law or politics and still bring some environmental perspectives into one of those degrees. And this approach is possible too. It's really easy if you're doing a Bachelor of Science to choose plenty of environment subjects and mix them up with a few others. But even those other degrees have generally got the flexibility to bring in courses from other schools. And we love having these students in our environment courses too. Either of these options are great, and the ANU is a great place to be doing them. I hope you think about studying environment at the ANU. Okay, thanks for that, and thanks to everyone who uh, has joined us this morning. Um, first, um, I just wanted to um, acknowledge any First Nations people who are joining us today. Here in Canberra, we're uh, meeting on the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and uh, we pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. So welcome to everyone. Um, this webinar is recorded um, and will be made available next week after the event. So you can ask questions either in the chat box or in the Q&A tab. Um, if you don't want your question to be in the recording, you can contact uh, the College of Science. I'm just gonna post the email address up there and um, we will remove that question. But yeah, welcome to um, ask questions at any time and we'll, we'll be getting to the Q&A later in the session. So uh, let's, let's kick it off. So we're talking about masters and um, honours years um, here at the Fenner School of Environment and Society in the College of Science at the ANU. I will just um, get everyone to introduce themselves and uh, just mention what their role is here and um, yeah, just a thought about Fenner. So I'll start with you, Sarah. Uh, okay, thanks, Pete, and, and hi, everyone. So I'm Sarah Beavis. I'm uh, an academic at the Fenner School. Um, my background is in engineering geology, but I teach and do research in, in water. Uh, and uh, that research uh, is focused in Australia and Indonesia and the Pacific. I teach uh, water management and water science and also the Fiji Field School. And you saw a few uh, pictures of uh, my students in Fiji uh, in the last few years in that, in that footage just earlier. I'm uh, responsible for the master's program here at Fenner uh, and I co-convene the master's uh, advanced program and the honours program as, as well. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. Thanks, Sarah. I'll go to you, uh, Rob, next. Um, if you could introduce yourself. Oh, hi, uh, <clears throat> I'm Robert Dybel, um, and obviously I'm at uh, the Fenner School. Uh, and my subject area is human ecology. 
Uh, and you heard from Saul's introduction that the Finna School is very much about bridging uh, environmental environmental change issues for better or worse uh, with those considerations of those socio-cultural drivers uh, and of course the consequences that uh, people and societies feel as a result of those change issues uh, environmental change issues and indeed the social justice dimensions of where those burdens fall more heavily on uh, poor and disadvantaged uh, socioeconomic groups and countries. So human ecology uh, is, uh, takes that, those considerations to its core, and that's very much what I am involved in. My specific area of uh, interest is in food systems. Uh, and so obviously uh, food uh, has both a physical dimension and environmental dimension. Uh, but it's very much a cultural practice of food preferences and uh, the celebration of eating or indeed uh, uh, the health consequences of eating poorly or not having enough food to eat at all. So that's my area and I supervise uh, honours students uh, and master's students broadly in topics relating to either systems thinking and those uh, human social uh, issues, but um, most specifically in relationship to uh, food procurement and food consumption. So that's me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charlie. All right, over to you, Sam, and you look like you're in an extremely sunny spot there here on campus. Yeah, I apologize for this kind of dappled light, but it's too nice outside to, to not be here. So um, my name's Sam Provost. I'm a PhD student at the Fenner School, um, and I I convene uh, a course that looks at indigenous land management and policy issues uh, out of the school. I, I'm kind of fan of born and bred, I suppose. I did my undergraduate in resource and environmental management, and I did a master's, uh, an advanced master's of environment through the Fenner School. And now I'm, I'm here doing my PhD in teaching. Um, what I, and looking at in my PhD is uh, I, I'm a geographer, so I'm really interested in, in the ways that landscapes are represented and, and seen. Um, what my work uh, generally is looking at at the moment is, is leveraging emerging digital technologies uh, alongside Aboriginal communities so that we can pursue self-determination and sovereignty over traditional landscapes. Um, and that looks like a whole range of things, um, but something that I'm working on right now this week is um, I've worked with the uh, local Ngunnawal and Ngambri elders, um, and we've created uh, photogrammetry models of scarred trees here on campus, culturally significant trees. Um, I've created digital models and then we've printed I've got some here, so we've oh, printed cool. 3D <laughs> models of them. Uh, and then this week I'm working with the School of Art and Design um, to start casting these trees in glass um, so that we can use, we can create a forest of, of scar trees and use the, that to have a discussion about the, the, sorry, the precarity of these trees within this landscape. Um, so yeah, I, I make maps generally, but I'm looking at fun little things like this as well because COVID means that we can't necessarily get out there and do the field work that, um, that I would otherwise be doing. But we're here and we're doing it. Yeah, and I, I guess that shows the level of um, innovation in, in, in the kind of thinking we like to teach here um, at, at the ANU. Um, I might start with you, Sam, to ask about what is a master's or, or, or an honours year. Um, I think the best thing would be to just tell, tell your story. So, you know, paint a bit of a picture of your, your journey to how you got to your PhD and, you know, some of the um, choices you have to make, some of the challenges. Yeah, let's, let's just hear about your master's journey and then we'll get into sort of more of the technical discussion about um, how, if you're considering joining us here at Manu, how you can actually set up your master's degree and speak with Sarah and love on that one. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Pete. Um, so, like I said, I did my, my undergraduate degree at the Fenner School in Resource and Environmental Management. Uh, that degree program is 
uh, it's been renamed and I think it's something like a, a Bachelor of Sustainability now. Um, but uh, essentially, I, through my, my undergraduate, I, I found that I was really interested in GIS. Before I started my, my degree, I had no idea what GIS was. Um, and GIS is Geographic Information Systems, but it's, it's a way of thinking about and producing maps. Um, so I, I guess that's the, what I think one of the main benefits of doing a degree uh, as kind of open as as a Bachelor of Sustainability, something like that is you as you dig deeper into what's available, uh, new opportunities emerge and reveal themselves to you. So, you know, I kind of thought that I would want to train up and become a ranger, maybe with national parks or be working in, in forests somewhere. And um, when I found out that there was this thing called GIS and I could uh, draw down imagery from satellites and interrogate landscapes and find ways to represent that information in ways that tell a deeper and richer narrative about the places that we inhabit. Uh, that was really, really exciting to me. And um, so I, I started moving in that direction. Um, I guess the, the next step was to try and find a supervisor. Um, and so the, the lecturer of the GIS courses that I took here um, was Bruce Doran. I, I um, Dr. Bruce Doran, he's a fantastic uh, academic working in, in GIS and he's worked with a lot of indigenous communities. Um, particularly, he's been working with the Yaru community in Broome and um, he's working with the Yorta Yorta community down in Victoria as well. So I knew that uh, he had a really solid base for the kind of work that I wanted to do with my community. I, sh I should say I'm you in person from the south coast of New South Wales. Um, so that's my community down there. So, so I, I approached him and, and fortunately he agreed to come on as my supervisor for my master's program. And then the next thing was making sure that I actually got the grades to be able to enroll in the program. And it's a really interesting uh, program because the way that it works is you can enroll in what's called a master's advanced um, program, which essentially means that you do one year of, um, of study of coursework. And then if you, if you do well, then you can transfer into a one year uh, dissertation uh, where you do the research and you write up a, a dissertation. Um, so I was able to get, get into that program, fortunately, um, and, and I was really happy that because I had done my undergraduate here, I actually got six months of the program credited, uh, which meant that I, I did six months of coursework and then I could move into my dissertation. And that was a, a huge year for me. So I, um, I was working with my community back on the coast and we were looking at ways to create maps that more accurately represent Aboriginal ways of knowing country and understanding our landscapes um, in ways that told a deeper story than just the, the kind of government um, maps that we have or the cadastral maps. Um, so that meant spending a lot of time uh, with the community, interviewing them. Uh, there was a mixture of qualitative and quantitative data capture and then I analyzed that and, and I wrote up my thesis and um, fortunately it, it, I had good markers and um, so I received a, a really good grade for that which meant that I could then move into to my PhD work where I'm now expanding on on what I did as a master's student so it's kind of a linear progression and um, I haven't personally done honours, but a lot of my colleagues and a lot of my friends have done an honours year. And, and my understanding is it's essentially the same thing, but you don't do the coursework component. Um, and there are a few nuances, I think, that maybe Rob and Sarah can speak to when, when they do. Um, for me, when I started my undergrad, like I said, you know, I was hoping to get a job in, in government somewhere. I didn't even think that I would 
consider being an academic or I didn't even really know that being an academic was an option or a career path that was available to me. So um, I guess I learned a lot and I'm really thankful that what I have learned has set me up to, to now be in a space where I get to do research for a living, which is, is amazing. And I get to teach, um, you know, we call it research led teaching. So the courses that I teach draw heavily on the work that I do with community uh, and then we can explore the issues and the theory around that. So, um, yeah, I do count myself very lucky to, to have been here with Fenner for the last five, six years. And um, I mean, I'm scheduled to be here for another five and maybe even 20, who knows? Thanks so much, Sam. Um, I will, might hand over to um, Sarah um, to, you know, let's, let's talk about you know, how do you structure a master's or an um, honours? What is the um, difference? As, um, as Sam said, there is a difference, but there's a lot of similarities. And yeah, um, obviously there's the coursework path, but there's also fieldwork paths. Let's, let's just hear a bit about that. Uh, you're on mute, Sarah, so you'll have to. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Um, Yes, look, let's um, consider honours first, which is essentially for a full-time student, it's the fourth year of study uh, at undergraduate level. Uh, in order to enter into an honours program, a student needs to have a, a credit average. Uh, so that's an average between 60-70% uh, across all of the, uh, the courses that a student has taken. Uh, and uh, that is a, a full year, essentially, of research that a student will take under supervision by an academic at the Fenner School. And we have such a broad range of um, disciplinary expertise and knowledge uh, in the Fenner School. So you've heard what um, Rob was talking about in, in terms of human ecology. There's a whole group that works in um, conservation biology. There are others who work in um, urban systems, um, climate, um, water, and um, a whole range of, of other disciplines. So students have a wide range of choices uh, on which to base their, their honours research. So that is, it's an academic year, but it, it occurs over essentially nine months. So it's a very, very um, focused uh, uh, activity in, in research where uh, a range of skills are required that weren't necessarily um, available to a student during their uh, the previous three years. There's also a, a coursework component for our honours students, uh, and those are a series of workshops that students take. Uh, there are about um, 10 to 12 of those workshops that are offered, and really they're, they're providing um, uh, uh, additional skills in, in how to write a thesis, how to undertake research, and also additional skills that are associated with writing a very large piece of, of, of work. So uh, EndNote, for example, becoming familiar with all the foibles of, of Word, uh, for example. Uh, so students generally uh, in their undergraduate years start to really get a sense of, of what they're interested in. Uh, as Sam was talking about his own journey with GIS, for example, remote sensing. Uh, and as the student acquires that, that, that um, interest and focus in their studies, they can start having conversations with academic staff uh, to find out whether there's um, a potential for, for that staff member to, to supervise them. As mainly as they meet those uh, requirements of that credit average, and they found themselves uh, a supervisor, it's very easy to enrol into the honours uh, program. The master's program, uh, there are a number of uh, masters that are available at Fenner. There's the Masters of Environment uh, and uh, there's the Masters of Environmental Science, the uh, Masters of Climate Change and the Master of Forestry. Each of those can be taken as two years of coursework. 
Uh, so that's a full load of four courses uh, per semester over four semesters. Or there is the advanced uh, option where a student takes uh, two semesters worth of coursework and uh, as mainly as they, they meet a, a distinction average requirement uh, over that first year of study, they have the option to then uh, go into uh, the advanced program of um, research. So that is one, one full year of research that uh, um, is, is, um, produces in the end uh, a thesis. So the process of finding a supervisor uh, and having a topic very similar to honours, the dissertation is uh, slightly longer than an honours. And what we tend to find, uh, not it's, it's, this is a bit of a generalisation, but for honours, we tend to have uh, students moving through from their undergraduate bachelor's program into an honours, uh, and more generally for a master's, uh, students are coming from uh, already having had some experience uh, in their own professional fields. Uh, but that's only a generalisation. But in terms of the research experience, uh, both honours and masters are, are fairly similar. I should note that uh, the Master of Environmental Science is a little bit different in uh, in the requirements to be enrolled in it, in that uh, students need to select a particular stream, whether that's going to be in environmental and ecological science, or in the earth science, or in um, uh, biological science. Uh, and uh, so the, the requirements there are a little bit tighter, uh, but it, it provides, again, uh, opportunities for acquiring a whole range of, of different knowledges and skills relevant to a range of, of uh, disciplines relevant to environment. So I think I've captured uh, the requirements and, and the basic uh, characteristics of each of those programs, Pete. Yeah, I, I think so. Thank you, Sarah. I, um, part of the journey is is finding a uh, supervisor. So, Rob, I want to ask you about that. What's what's sort of the process involved in that, and how um, when you are a master's student, you know, what's that relationship like? You know, in, in terms of teaching and and I'm learning and getting feedback and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So the uh, the supervisor to uh, to, to student researcher uh, relationship becomes uh, fairly personal at a honours and masters level. Uh, you're entering a territory where, as the student, you're very much uh, a junior academic in your own right, and any form of that sort of uh, master to student sort of down teaching to the to the um, to the uh, to the junior learner that starts to dissolve and a more partnership type arrangement starts to manifest. Uh, the student in both of those programs, certainly for the advanced masters, uh, is becoming an expert in their own right, in their own field. And the supervisory role in that uh, becomes one of guidance and feedback uh, and to suggest pathways and ideas. And the student is progressively becoming a master of their own knowledge and their own field. Uh, so uh, you are genuine, you are starting to develop a, a more collaborative uh, arrangement uh, and in many cases the student uh, will in the course of that uh, that learning journey start to attend conferences and write papers in their own right and actually start to to perform as uh, as, a, as a, a an academic uh, and an early career academic and you heard from Sam uh, you know actually moving into uh, academic positions of formal um, as a formal lecturer, uh, very common to become a tutor uh, and, um, and start to, uh, to uh, stretch your wings as an academic. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, um, that's, that's it. And, oh, the only other thing I was going to say is, uh, and I can know that some of the people listening in here are, are students of the ANU, uh, do take on a field that uh, interests you, that fires you up, that uh, you are genuinely enthusiastic about um, because it's uh, there's a, a degree of work involved and 
taking on something that doesn't sort of really get you going is, um, is, is not a good recipe. And do not overlook the, uh, the personality dimension to your relationship with your supervisor, right? You're human beings. Um, you've got to, in some sense, get on. Okay? You know, the, the idea that uh, you're just dropping in once, a, once a, a week to sort of update this person and where you're at, that's not the nature of the relationship at all. So there is a, a human personal dimension to it that you, uh, that you need to, to be aware of and to just go with people that you think you've got some kind of rapport with in both directions, yeah. So in, in terms of actually finding a supervisor, is it ju just as simple as asking? Um, how does that work? This is probably a, um, quite a novice question. But <laughs> uh, uh, so oftentimes, it's slightly different for honours with masters, um, but in both cases, typically what you're doing, uh, you've done well in some piece of coursework, you've done well in, say, your, your, your major, and there's some particular course that you took that you really liked, and as a result of doing one in that course, you're almost certainly, well, you will be known uh, to, to the convener of that course. And so you heard about Sam in doing well with Bruce. Bruce would have been aware of Sam as a good student in this course. And so when Sam goes knocking on the door to sort of start sounding Bruce out, you'll find that the academic is, knows, knows who you are and is open to, to engage in that discussion. Uh, ask around. In Fenner, we run with two uh, supervisors for honours and uh, there's typically a lead supervisor uh, and then a secondary supervisor that you um, maybe you're looking to fill some some gap in your knowledge base that you think you need a second supervisor to get uh, on with any supervisor any potential supervisor will will spend uh, some degree of your time with uh, to, to chat through these issues the only thing I suggest to you is that you don't knock on the door of someone when you haven't actually thought about what it is that they do uh, and shown some interest in what their field is because that's just common uh, sort of decency. But any Fenner uh, academic would uh, would spend time answering some basic questions about um, their availability and some suggestions, yeah. Thanks, Rob. Uh, the next question I wanted to ask is when, when uh, you know, undergraduates are applying to um, look at their honours or their masters, what are some of the things they really need to think about like, like um, in terms of the application process but also you know if you're looking at um, federal funding for um, study options that kind of thing what are some of those um, pitfalls and things to sort of keep in mind um, I'll open that to the floor if you would like to to answer that one I might be able to speak to this from a student's perspective um, you know I, I think it's really interesting in my undergrad there's this kind of mantra that gets thrown around this idea that P's get degrees. I heard this a lot when I was, I was in my undergraduate degree, meaning that, you know, as long as you pass, you get your degree. Um, and I think what often isn't discussed explicitly in relation to that is that um, you actually, if like for, for my, my course, my master's project, when you're going into a master's course, um, a master's can be quite expensive. Um, and the government offers something called a Commonwealth supported place for uh, a number of students nationally moving into master's programs. This is, I think, domestic students only. Um, and it significantly reduces the cost um, that you wear as as a master's student coming in now um, when i talked to the people in the in the sector there they kind of said look if you've got a if you've got a distinction average so if you've got a gpa of um you know six and above um you're you're in a really good standing to to get that um support um you know and even from a five and above but it, it starts tapering off so I just think um, it's important to know that your GPA actually does matter when you're going in, um, when it actually plays out in how much you're going to spend on a master's program. I didn't know that when I was an undergrad and I was just lucky that I had a good GPA. Um, but yeah, something important to think about. Absolutely. Um, yep. One thing to add to that too is, you know, if, if a student is is trying to decide whether they want to move from uh, a pass degree, undergraduate degree, into either honours or masters, uh, an undergraduate um, 
honours is still considered undergraduate. Uh, so there will be um, con continuation of Centrelink uh, support for a student doing honours, uh, but that, that is not available to um, master's students. So the funding support, as Sam's just said, uh, may be available for those Commonwealth supported um, uh, positions, but, but um, generally uh, there's, a, there's a higher cost associated with, um, with the master's programs, and that's something to be aware of. Uh, but look, I, I really appreciate what you've just said, Sam, too, in, in relation to really being strategic through, uh, through one's undergraduate uh, studies. If, if you're looking sort of further into the future and opportunities being available to you, uh, just aiming for pass uh, uh, grades is, is sort of closing closing doors and closing opportunities. So, you know, striving to do one's best means that you have more options available to you as you go into the possibility of um, honours or masters. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, we're gonna open it up to the floor now, um, if anybody are, um, would like to ask questions. Uh, so you can type that in the Q&A or the uh, chat window and we encourage it. Um, I'm sure it, even if you feel um, it might be uh, an, an obvious question or something, there's probably someone else who is also thinking that as well. So they'd certainly be grateful for that. Uh, just in the meantime, while we wait for any questions to come through, um, I'm going to put, oh wait, look, one has, one has come out. So here we go. Can you go on to do a PhD with either an honours or masters? Yes. Yes. Yes, you certainly can. Uh, so both honours and masters are pathways to a PhD. And again, it's really a matter of making sure that uh, you exit either of those programs with a high enough uh, grade result uh, to be competitive uh, for selection into um, a PhD program. Thank you. So, just add uh, that yeah. a first class honours uh, coming out of the Australian National University will be recognised as PhD candidate material for consideration any university in the, around, the, around the globe. Uh, there, there may be other factors like the eligibility and cost, but the, the recognition of the quality of the certificate uh, is, is, is global. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one thing uh, that's interesting in that planning that you're talking about, Sarah, too, is, um, you know, having that redundancy there, because I, um, I've i spoken to a few colleagues of mine who are making this decision between, well, do you do an honours or do you do a master's? And, and some of the things that come up is, well, honours honors is kind of in Australia, the, the planned pathway into PhD, as far as I understand. Um, but a master's program, you know, I think if you're planning not to do a PhD, then probably a master's would set you up for uh, a different set of, of job opportunities. You would be considered sort of skilled at a higher level maybe than if you leave with an honours. But if you're planning to go into a PhD, then it makes a lot of sense to go straight through that honours um, pathway. Thanks, Sam. Um, you know, both both honours and masters can can uh, certainly lead into uh, a career in in research, but I think the masters in particular uh, is is really seen very favourably uh, for um, going into to other professions. I should note also that that a masters um, a masters advanced uh, with that dissertation associated with it. Uh, particularly is much, much better recognised internationally uh, than an honours. There are quite a few countries around the world who don't necessarily understand what the honours uh, represents. I think the honours really comes out of the British system. Uh, so it's something that you see in universities uh, associated with the old Commonwealth, um, but not necessarily uh, understood uh, wider than that yeah absolutely and i think 
nationally though it, it is um I, I just want to be clear you know when i said before don't don't do honors and then don't uh, go into phd that'll leave you in a precarious position that's not um necessarily correct uh i did an internship at geoscience australia when i was an undergraduate and i know that their um, graduate program intake is getting so competitive now that actually an honours will put you in a position where you're far more likely to move into uh, one of those niche government sectors. Um, they, they really recognise that. So you don't necessarily have to go on and do the PhD. That's very useful to, to, to recognise Sam, thanks. One question I had uh, to ask is when you actually put uh, writing your uh, dissertation, what I'm, I'm like, I know with a PhD, you might sort of be coming up with a certain idea on which you'd really like to explore. There's a lot of, you know, new research that you're doing. For a master's um, and you're doing your dissertation, is that, is it kind of similar or is it sort of um, basing it off other ideas that you're exploring just to expand on? Like, what's actually involved in, in, um, in writing that? I guess as someone that's written one, relatively recently, I can um, speak to that briefly. My understanding is that uh, master's and honors uh, dissertation and theses um, years are, are framed as a kind of a, an apprenticeship in research. So like you said, or you alluded to, Pete, you're not necessarily uh, producing this novel work um, that's going to change the world, but you're, you're really dipping your toe into that that research process and what what that entails and and how to write it that doesn't mean that a master's dissertation or an honors dissertation doesn't produce um, new and interesting research but it is i think it, yeah it's it's a way of learning what research is like and whether or not that actually suits you um, and it's a good good way to get an idea of whether or not you want to move into a phd program or something like that Thanks, Sam. We, we've got another question that's coming. Yeah. So, Phoebe, hi. Um, the uh, the skill sets that you think you might be missing from what you've covered off on your uh, through your undergraduate uh, uh, pathway, uh, if if you design a, a a project that requires some additional skill that you don't have, you're either going to be able to get it from this fairly uh, tight relationship with your supervisor who uh, can can help uh, fill uh, fill that out, or it is possible in some cases to uh, audit undergraduate courses that teach those skills, uh, just simply through the process of asking the uh, convener uh, if you can indeed uh, uh, sit in uh, on a not for a, a not for um, assessment basis. But by and large, uh, what you typically find is that the, the honours, in your case, is extending uh, those skill areas that you are uh, have got some experience in and, and I think that you uh, want to do in a more intense and applied way. Uh, and in FENA, unlike in other uh, honours programmes elsewhere in the, um, in the university, uh, we really do tend to think that you, you, you finish with undergraduate training, you don't need more undergraduate coursework, uh, and we're going to essentially uh, nurture you into that applied uh, research. So uh, the research-led learning mantra that we have at the ANU, uh, you are the researcher um, and your learning is being led by your development as yourself as a researcher. So um, I hope that answers your question uh, to, to, uh, to an extent at least. Could, could I add to that too, Rob? Um, hi, Phoebe. Uh, Look, I, I just no, noticed that that you're you're asking about quantitative and qualitative research skills. Uh, when you when you put in your application for um, honours, uh, and and also when you're putting together your, your proposal itself, you can uh, identify uh, particular skills that you you uh, might need during your program. Uh, and once these are, are identified, 
uh, we can certainly look at ways in which uh, there, there is the relevant support being provided to you. So it might be that uh, you need to acquire more skills in GIS or it might be uh, in statistical analysis or something like that. Uh, as, as many as we identify what those are early on, uh, there, there can be the support arranged for you uh, to be, meet your research requirements. Thanks, Sarah. I agree. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, I guess, yeah, absolutely. In terms of those sort of hard qualitative skills, whether it's data capture or a, a specific software package that you need to get across to do your work, um, that there are ways of, of getting trained up in that. Um, nothing also, I don't think anything beats just locking yourself in for a few days with the, with the software and and getting your head around it but there is support um and i guess from a from a qualitative perspective i felt like uh you know when i was moving into my master's program i didn't really have the qualitative and theory training that i required for the type of project that i was doing because i was bringing together both the the quantitative and the qualitative aspects um, and there was a whole set of literature and theory that I, I hadn't been across in my undergrad, but that's kind of what the first section of your honours or your master's dissertation or thesis um, years is, is it's expected that you will do a lot of reading, you'll get across the literature, you'll produce a literature review, and through that process, that's kind of a training in itself, you know, by the end of it, you'll be an expert on whatever that theoretical base that you're working from is. I want to jump in and answer, address the mature student. Hello from Geelong. Uh, you, with your interest in uh, intersection between religion, sociology, and some uh, aspect of environment, you say you're particularly uh, interested in birds. You are a classic uh, Fenner uh, uh, scholar in the in the making. Um, the master's program I would suggest you would uh, gravitate towards would be the master of environment, not master of environmental science, because the master of environment allows you to take pots of study from across the university, uh, including with our colleagues in, um, in the College of um, Arts and, and Social Sciences uh, to strengthen and complement what, uh, what you've already done and what you want to extend yourself into and prepare yourself for doing that crossover between how uh, religion, worldviews, uh, value sets, beliefs, uh, informs how we think of ourselves in relationship to aspects of the natural world, including venerating it, uh, or of course, in some cases, um, the whatever the appropriate opposite of venerating the natural world is, des destroying, I suspect. Uh, and you would be able to pick those courses quite broadly uh, through the structure of a master environment. So correct me if I'm wrong. Um, look, uh, I, if I can add to that, thank you, to Rob. Uh, also, uh, by applying to the master of environment, uh, for me to, to approve that enrolment, I need to see that a student has taken the approach, has, has a degree in appropriate cognate uh, areas. And uh, those cognate areas, disciplinary areas, are much, much broader uh, for the Master of Environment rather than the uh, Master of Environmental Science. So uh, yes, Rob is absolutely correct. Uh, the Master of in Environment uh, would be your choice because of uh, your own disciplinary background. Yeah, well, I suppose that's something to really highlight about the Fenner School is that it's not not just looking at um, physical data and quantitative data, and it's really looking at bringing all those um, societal elements and thinking about, well, how does this, um, you know, um, all, all the issues impact communities and how does it, you know, impact um, economics and all that kind of stuff, so. Um, okay, thanks, Lisa. Um, I don't know if we've got any other questions, but I might um, just open for any final thoughts from anyone if, if they would like to put that forward. Uh, Sam, did you have anything you want to say? Sure. I, I would just like to say that I 
was unsure whether I wanted to do masters of I was um, or honors or anything after my undergraduate degree. I knew I was interested in it, but I just didn't know. It felt like a really big uh, commitment to make. I'd already spent you know, four years doing my undergrad and and thinking about another two, one and a half, or, or whatever it is. Um, it was it was quite daunting. Um, but having done it, I had an amazing experience and it's actually changed my life and put me on a trajectory where I'll, I'll be a, a lifelong academic, um, you know, all things uh, playing out the way that I hope they will and national, international viruses notwithstanding, but um, it's, it's fantastic and it, it's really, really great. So I encourage anyone to um, consider it. The Fenner School is fantastic. I've had so much support from, um, you know, the director of the school, even the, the dean of the college down to um, my colleagues. And, um, and there's a lot of support at, at that master's and, and honors level um, from colleagues um, and, and other students. So just, yeah, I'd encourage anyone to, to have a really good think about it because it's valuable. Okay. Sarah, do you want to take that question about upscaling from a certificate to a... I certainly can. Lisa, thank you for this uh, question about um, uh, taking Masters of Environment via um, certificates or diplomas. I was only having conversation uh, with a student uh, this morning about this. Uh, certainly, uh, the um, graduate certificate or the graduate diplomas are, are now being seen as uh, pathways into uh, Masters programs. So it's really, the, um, you know, if we're looking at the graduate certificate, for example, just taking uh, initially two, two subjects or four subjects, uh, it's, a, it's a really gentle entree uh, where you can feel your way and make a decision um, bit by bit, semester by semester, uh, whether this is something that you want to commit to. So uh, yes, it is a very viable uh, and attractive uh, pathway into masters. Thank you. All right. Well, um, yeah, I'll get Sarah and Rob to leave any final final thoughts. So um, Sam reflected on um, on the impact of, of COVID, uh, which is obviously something we're all uh, moving through. Um, under normal circumstances, a vast amount of research being done. At honours and uh, master's level at Fenner uh, is potentially uh, certainly regional, if not global, uh, in its in its reach and study. And um, whilst that's uh, currently suspended, uh, I suspect uh, some form of normality will re return in time. Uh, and so, studies that are uh, conducted in places like the Philippines and Singapore, uh, elsewhere in the region, um, you know, will will again uh, will again be possible in some aspects of those, of course, we can do uh, from, from, our, from Australia and from home. Uh, but my, I have a student at the moment working on food systems in Singapore, uh, from Singapore. I've got students working on uh, the impact of COVID on people's food purchasing preferences and choices and how they go about procuring food and whether there's been a shift from purchasing through supermarkets to more, more directly. So, um, the range of, of study field sites and areas of, of application geographically uh, at both honours and master's level uh, is and will continue to be uh, potentially anywhere in the, in, in the globe, irrespective of, of uh, how COVID um, plays out in terms of actual travel potentials for the near term future. Just thought I'd say that. That's, that's a really good point. Rob, and certainly with students who are thinking about honours uh, next year or um, uh, masters advanced, that would now be in two years' time. I think that's more secure, but we do need to acknowledge uh, uncertainty around uh, the, the, the choices that can be made in relation to field-based studies. So if you're thinking of, of honours in particular for next year, uh, then be, be really cognisant of the, the, the constraints on uh, field work that goes beyond uh, your, local, your local region. 
uh, because that could be problematic. Always good to choose uh, a research topic uh, that is going to be um, as little challenged as possible in yeah. this current environment. I agree. I agree. Um, you know, I think especially in your honours or your masters, it's really you want something that you can get done and you want something that's going to give you the skill set that you need to to move into the future. Um, you know, my PhD work, I'm working with, supposed to be working with five Aboriginal communities around the nation. And of course, who knows when that's going to be actually happening. But the, the interesting thing about Fenner is that um, we were one of the first schools that actually started allowing, re-allowing field work because so many of our um, researchers and, and students you know, it's pretty easy to go into the forest near Canberra and study a tree and, and not see anyone in miles. So, you know, you, you can choose a, a subject where you don't actually have to come in contact with anyone. Although, as Saul said in the video, we do like to think about the social aspects of all of our work as well. Um, but you can do Zoom interviews as well. So there are options. I wouldn't say it's completely off the cards. Just as Sarah said, you know, think about what you're planning and, and whether it's feasible. I noticed that there's another question from Lisa and it's about the difference between the Masters of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, really, Lisa, the, the, the differences there are on the, um, the structuring of uh, requirements of what are compulsory courses, uh, what needs to be taken to um, uh, really navigate your way through through your program with a much much higher level of specialization in the master of climate change so i i really encourage you to go to the anu website uh, and uh, for for students look at uh, programs and courses and uh, pull up Master of Environment and Master of Climate Change, and you'll be able to see how those two programs are, are structured differently. And, and you'll see um, quite clearly that that much higher level of specialization and focus on climate, climate change in uh, the Master of Climate Change, much broader uh, um, choices of subjects in the Master of Environment. Thanks, Sarah. And I think, um, yeah, just before we go, Rob, did you have any final thoughts? Or had you already all been? All right, then. My final thought is uh, for, I guess this is primarily for the students who are uh, uh, current undergraduates, considering whether they should or should not go on to do uh, honours. Uh, my final thought thought is that if you have the grades to get you into honours, you would be highly advised to, to take the opportunity to pursue uh, uh, honours. Um, I think the honours certificate uh, definitely uh, places you in a, a, a class above uh, your, basically your fellows and um, in the job market and in future career prospects. Uh, the honours is the gold standard certificate to show that you were uh, the, in the top echelon of the students of your of your cohort, and du ducking out, uh, however tempting it might be, uh, uh, and passing that opportunity up, I, I think is something you would probably, well, very possibly would re would regret um, uh, in in the future. So strongly would encourage you to take honours or masters uh, if you have the grade grades to get you in. And if I can add to that too, uh, with with an honours or a masters. Uh, what you are able to demonstrate to a potential um, employer is that you, you, you're meeting every criteria that they are looking for. Uh, so, you know, just really basic stuff like being able to meet deadlines. Um, you are able to demonstrate it because you've, you've worked on a project uh, uh, under very tight uh, timeframes. Uh, you've been able to acquire a whole range of new skills uh, and knowledge that would be highly attractive and meet uh, the needs of employers. Pass 
um, students, students who've just done their three years, aren't able to demonstrate uh, those really essential uh, work, work uh, related um, skills. Fantastic. Yeah, it puts you in um, puts you in contention for a university medal too, which is you know if if you can pull that off, then you get any job that you want in the in the area. So um, that's the only way you can get it, you know, getting first class uh, honors or, or masters. So it's um, it's worthwhile thinking about. Yep. Well, thanks everyone who's joined us for this uh, session today. Um, I've posted up the Fenner School environment and society website um, just in the chat window there so do check it out check out some of the research that we're doing um, have a look at what some of our academics and lecturers are actually researching and how that's incorporated into teaching um, and yeah if, if you have any questions don't be afraid to get in touch you can um, contact us at uh, School at anu.edu.au um, and lots of the uh, individual academics are also happy to be um, contacted as well. And you'll, you'll find their email um, on the website there. Um, this recording will be up next week. And for those watching the recording, hello. And uh, thanks so much, everyone. And thanks to our wonderful panelists for joining us today. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Get outside today. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs>